Welcome, fellow dreamers. As Julie Sweet says, if your dreams do not scare you, they are not big enough. In a world where change and transition are constant companions, it might be difficult to make our dreams actionable. So today, join us this captivating journey as we explore stories of those who turn dreams into realities, meet and greet skilled sailors navigating their ships in tempestuous weather. Let's make our dreams actionable amidst the ever-changing world. Get ready for an inspiring online event like no other. So greetings, I am Özlem Akdoğan, Director of Division Relations at the Young Professionals Division in TAPI. Today, we delve into the art of fearlessness and preparedness within the context of change and transition. As you navigate in your career, you will need those tips and tricks and be sure to have the pen and paper ready. While I have honor of moderating today's session, I'm not alone on this. A accompanying me is the remarkable Mark Sorensen, representing the Coating and Graphic Arts Division. So together, Mark and I, we are poised to bring you an unforgettable experience filled with insightful discussions as well as invaluable perspectives. So today, I was just gonna say, thank you for being here and we will gonna continue with the agenda. So in today's agenda, we will gonna start introducing our moderators and panelists. We will gonna continue with breaking some ice. So give you a little bit chance to get to know our panelists a little bit better. And after that, I'll be talking about all about the open house and what does it actually bring to the table. And after that, there will be a Q&A we will gonna explore some questions and you will be able to participate those questions as well. And after that, uh, it will be all about coating and graphic arts. What can coating and graphic arts can do for young professionals? And before we wrap up, we will gonna talk about what we learned today and what's in the next for the open house and the CGA. So a little bit about me. Um, I am a TAPI member since 2020, and I am actually sitting both side of CGA as well as the young professionals. So my journey started very um, unorthodox way because I am actually in the plastic side of the business. So I moved to paper and now I am part of the food packaging. So my life was a little bit in ups and downs, just like everyone else. And right now, me and my husband, we live, we live in Chicago. And my family is in Turkey. And I'm really enjoying what the life brings from the Tapicon to open house, presenting my research and being part of this greater good makes me really feel alive. So I'm really happy to be here today. Thank you. Well, Aslam, uh, this is Mark. Uh, thank you so very much for uh, inviting us to be part of this uh, event today. Uh, we're excited to be here. We're excited to share some of the things that uh, uh, we as professionals in the coding and graphic arts division have learned and maybe can uh, help you with as we go forward uh, in this uh, journey together. Uh, I, as you might see on my screen, I'm, uh, I'm retired. Uh, I worked for Beloit Corporation, Coosters and Andritz for somewhere in the neighborhood of about 44 years and kind of decided that was enough at some point in time and, and uh, uh, worked in the dry end operations of uh, the uh, paper machines. So coating, calendaring, uh, control deflection rolls, that sort of thing. So I've got a lot of uh, uh, experience in the uh, converting side of the business. You see a lot of things that go on from there. Anyway, the uh, the point I wanted to make on this slide, uh, aside from my beautiful wife and uh, grandkids, is that the uh, uh, opportunity in joining Tappy in 1980 really became a springboard for me to really develop a lot of skill sets and uh, connections that really helped me through my entire career. And I think we will be sharing some of that uh, with you today, but uh, uh, we appreciate being here. We appreciate you being here and uh, thanks for your time. Now I'm gonna turn it over to Prakash.
Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you, Mark. Uh, my name is Prakash Mala. I'm currently the director of research at TL, TL and Company. Uh, I have been with the company for 31 years, so it's been a long time, but time flies, right? Uh, I came to TL by way of Penn State, where I worked for five years uh, developing microporous or nanoporous material as a, you know, for desiccation or dehumidification uh, purpose. And uh, now we are currently involved here uh, making new product and improving process for, uh, for kaolin. As you know, kaolin is one of the most important pigments for paper coating and you get uh, all kind of uh, functional properties uh, from TL. And I joined TAPI as a member back in 1992. So it has been about 30, 31 years. And my affiliation with TAPI has been very fulfilling and uh, very interesting to me and uh, uh, very helpful. And I have served in different, uh, at TAPI at different capacity. And hopefully again, as Mark said, we'll get to discuss a little more on, uh, about the TAPI and how TAPI, uh, your TAPI involvement can help you on your career. Thank you. Hey everybody, um, my name is Megan hostetler Schrock, and I work for Primiant, uh, which is a starch supplier to the industry. Um, I'm the Director of Applications and Technical Service, so both technical service and uh, new product development. Um, I started out with a paper company, um, Warehouser, um, and then um, I actually joined TAPI back in 2000 before um, all the divisions were together, part of paper makers, and, and presented a paper jointly with one of our suppliers. Um, but then I wasn't really involved much in uh, TAPI until um, I moved to Tate Lau, now Premiant, um, and started to get involved, um, whether that was um, covering some of the binders, natural binders um, portions of the coding course. Um, and that just kind of led to further and further engagement and involvement and meeting more people and networking. So for me, that's been a, one of the greatest things about being part of um, the Coding and Graphic Arts Committee and, and TAPI in general is um, meeting all the people that I would not have met um, if I just attended the TAPI conference. So um, I think for me, you can really um, make it what you want. There's so many great people. Um, and so um, getting involved is uh, has been really fun. Other than that, I'm a boy mom. Um, we love sports and uh, we love our dogs. So um, anyway, on to Brian, I think. All right, thanks, Megan. Uh, yes, so I'm Brian Einsla. I'm a senior research scientist at Dow. Um, I graduated from Virginia Tech and then uh, held two jobs in the fuel cell area after doing some fuel cell research at Tech. I moved to Los Alamos and Henkel before joining what is now Dow. I uh, started off as Roman Haas and then moved into Vision a few years ago. Uh, I served as the TPC chair and now the division chair. Um, and then uh, really happy, as she said, to have interacted with a lot of people and, and meet some really great people on that team that have helped me learn about the, the market space um, and helped me out with my job. Uh, outside of work, um, I have uh, two kids and uh, a wonderful wife, and you can see some some great pictures of some vacations and family that we've enjoyed over the last couple of years. So it's uh, a pleasure to talk to everybody today, and and I appreciate the opportunity that Oslem has presented. All right. If you're ready to get to know our panelists and co-moderators on a deeper level, let's kick start with an engaging icebreaker session. So today's question is, if you have an opportunity 
to host a late night talk show. Who would be your first guest and which game you play with them? So Mark, you wanna go first? Sure, Oswald. I, uh, I'm assuming that I can bring someone back from the uh, past here as my first guest in my talk show. Uh, I'm fascinated with uh, George Carlin. I think George Carlin is one of the truly brilliant minds in comedy over the past uh, 100 years, and I really uh, enjoy uh, what he did. But uh, in today's uh, uh, environment, uh, Jimmy Fallon has, a, uh, has an event on his show uh, called True Confessions. And I would love to have George Carlin in that uh, room and talk about whether things are true or not true relative to uh, some of the stories that he might have over the years. I think that would be fascinating and I, I love the opportunity to do something like that. So uh, having said that, I'll turn it over to Prakash and uh, let him tell you what he, uh, what he thinks. Uh, thank you, Mark. Uh, awesome said to bring one person, but uh, I think I'll bring two people at the same time. And again, uh, I'll, I'll go on a little bit more serious, serious side. Uh, I'll bring the Bill Gates and Elon Musk to discuss about the pressing global issue. For example, right now, as you know, we're facing with the climate change and again, the food security or poverty issues all over the world. Uh, even in the United States, we think that we are so advanced, uh, but we do have some food issue and food security issue, right? And uh, uh, not to uh, mention about the, the climate change, you know, uh, then what I would ask them would be how they feel that all the different countries, all the industry are doing or responding to mitigate the climate change, the impact of climate change. Um, they, the, how they would pars, uh, personally or through their vast wealth, they would contribute specifically uh, to these issues, um, especially with the Elon Musk, you know, um, electrical cars and vehicles, right? I mean, it needs a lot of the rare earth elements and critical minerals. And the China is uh, has a monopoly right now on these minerals and how, you know, how he would wish to mitigate that situation. And a lot of mining involves, and mining is an excellent thing, and we want to draw a lot of resources from the Mother Earth, but it, at the same time, we need to do it very sustainably. Um, so what would be his thoughts along that line? Thank you. Megan? Hey, well, I don't watch a lot of late night uh, talk shows, but uh, if I were to pick somebody, I would pick somebody like Oprah Winfrey um, or maybe Ellen DeGeneres who have interviewed hundreds, if not thousands of people um, across all kinds of different, um, you know, backgrounds. Um, as far as a game, I think that it would be more of like a rapid fire trying to dig in to learn who were their favorite interviews, who were the di most difficult interviews, what, you know, what they learned from different people. Um, so for me, um, pretty simple. So Brian. All right. Thanks, Megan. Um, yeah, good question for me. I think uh, it would be the Beatles. I'm a huge music fan, love their, love all the songs that they created. And I think if I had to pick one alive, it would be Paul McCartney just to, to interact and talk about what the, the days were like writing music, um, you know, being part of that band and, and the culture at the time. And I think if it was uh, sort of a game to play, I've seen him do this a, a few times, but he's just able to write songs about just about anything. So I'd love for the crowd and the late night talk show to just throw out some words and see his creative mind work and take all those words and structure them into a song. I think that would be a blast. So I'll turn it back to Aslam. Yeah, that's that was awesome. Yeah, I was just gonna say that 
I would definitely ask Kurt Cobain to jump in and sing the Smells Like Teen Spirit with me and write a song then together or maybe even cover the different artists songs with his own style definitely great awesome all right fantastic now let's continue our exhilarating journey with all about open house so this event is designed to foster familiarity with our incredible divisions and create a vibrant platform where you can actively engage in discussion isn't that cool so get ready to immerse yourself in this interactive experience and make meaningful connections along the way. So let's make this open house an unforgettable adventure together. So since today's honorary division is CGA, as an active member of this community, I can easily define them as following from a YP perspective. So first of all, they are really technically grounded as you see the panelists and my awesome commentator. And they offer great networking opportunities, not just in Tapicon, but everywhere. And they are collaborative and inquisitive. And next, I want to give the mic to Mark to talk about the CGA. Thank you. Well, thank you, Aslan. The uh, reason we uh, picked the dealing with change and transition topic for today's open house is that I think it's something that all of us uh, have to deal with in every portion of our life as we go through our careers and our personal lives. And in particular with coding and graphic arts, we are a division in transition and we have to embrace the changes that are going along with our, our area, uh, particularly as we think about how paper grades have evolved. Uh, when I first started in the industry, we had uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of 20 to 25 machines making publication grades only uh, in the coded paper market. We're down to somewhere in the neighborhood of like six or seven at this point in time. Uh, it's amazing the transition that's occurred as we go from electronic formats uh, uh, to printing formats and then back again. Uh, but we also recognize that the traditional processes need our technical support and expertise. And our jobs are changing. You know, our employers are, are asking us to do different things and to take on different challenges. So it's important for us to realize that there are, all of these things are, are changing. And in fact, our division change, uh, division name is going to change here in the new future, near future. We're going to uh, change it to coding, printing, and surface enhancement uh, to give a little bit better feel of what we do in the division relative to the process. So, so uh, we, what we'd like to do is uh, uh, take the, get some of the expertise from our uh, panelists today, Prakash, Megan, and Brian. And uh, what I'd like to ask you to do is if you have questions for them, go ahead and uh, type those in in the uh, question button down on the bottom of your screen. We'll pick those up and we'll pass that uh, question along to the panelists. And uh, we'll uh, try and answer the things that uh, are on the forefront of your mind today. What are the things that are, are you curious about? How do people deal with some of these things? So what, uh, what I'd like to do is we'll kick off a, 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 the discussion with a, a question that we had uh, kind of uh, uh, planted in the group here. And, and that is, what's, what's the most exciting part of change for our panelists? What, what are the things that really, uh, Get you excited about changing, uh, whether it be in your personal lives or in your professional lives. Uh, and uh, Prakash, I'll I'll start out with you, and then we can just kind of uh, filter through the uh, through the folks on the panel. Thank you, Mark. Again, uh, just going back to what Oslam asked earlier about the mid uh, late night show. I just wanted to mention that I forgot to answer about the playing game. I'm not sure about playing game during that show, but I would not mind drinking a beer or two with those guys. <laughs> with that, uh, on the, uh, the focus of our panel here today, you know, the change uh, we all know is very uncomfortable, right? And fearful and challenging for most everyone. And I'm not, no exception. However, I feel that uh, the change is also very exciting 
uh, is it offers opportunity to explore new things and excel. Uh, it helps us to be productive in our uh, workplace, maybe improving process of product, uh, reducing costs or reflecting on ourselves for self-improvement. But basically when that is a change, what happens is when the corporation can bring people together, all employees together, and the people will normally respond to the occasion um, to solve the problems in hand. So uh, overall change is a good thing. It can provide a lot of opportunities personally and also for a corporation. And overall, if correctly handled, uh, it can bring about great changes uh, in ourselves and in the company. Oh, thank you, Prakash. Megan, what, what's, what's the most exciting part of change for you? Yeah, I mean, somewhat similar to Prakash. I mean, for me, it's um, the learning that comes with it. No matter what change it is, you're going to learn something. Um, so good or bad, you're going to learn something um, and have to adapt to it, um, have to stretch yourself. Usually um, that leads to growth. So um, for me, those are the things that are exciting about it, even though it can be terrifying at the same time. Yeah, and, and Brian, you changed... Uh... Uh, substantially in your early in your career from uh, fuel cells to more of the paper coating side of the things. What, what, what was exciting for you as you made those moves? Sure. Yeah, that's good. And the, the company has even changed too, Dow throughout the years from Roman Haas and then being part of DuPont and then coming off as, as Dow Inc. I think as I look back through all those changes, it's always the opportunity to work with new people, right? It's uh, new people that have new skill sets, new interests. So it's it's always about the excitement level of working with somebody new. Oh, that's a, that's a great point, Brian. That uh, one of the things we find out in, in our uh, industry is there's so many smart people and there's so many people to learn from. It's just amazing. And it's one of the things that uh, we, we enjoy in the uh, coding and graphic arts division. Is that there's some incredible experience in people that we get to meet and work with. And that's, that's pretty cool. Uh, in, the, in that regard, uh, have you, have you ever been asked to take a position that you really didn't want and then make a change that you really didn't want to have to do? Uh, uh, Brian, do, have you ever been in that position or have you had control? Sure, it's, it's a good question. Um, I think I haven't been asked to take on a, a completely new role, um, but there's been lots of instances where I've been asked to work on small projects or uh, work on new areas that, that maybe I wasn't super excited about. I think one of the areas that um, somebody I, I worked with at the time had told me, um, you know, was kind of look at that project look at that and see who supports that. Um, one, for example, was you know, highly supported by our director at the time. And when you see that level of support from your leadership team, the advice that I was given was lean into it and do a really good job with it. Even though you might not be super excited about it, this is going forward and this is something that you know, is important to the business. Um, and there might even be areas that you can look at in that project to then enroll a new role that make you excited about it, you know, pull things out of it. Maybe if the, the technology is not super exciting, you can look at it as an opportunity to expand your project leadership and project management skills, you know, how you interact with stakeholders, how you effectively communicate with the team. So there's always portions of those projects that you can pull out and get excited about and grow from. Oh, that, that's powerful stuff, Brian. Yeah, that's great, uh, great advice. Have you ever experienced uh, something like that, Megan? Uh, being put into a spot that you really didn't want to be in? Yeah, yeah, actually, um, just last year. Um, so um, to go along with our company separating and becoming a, a brand new company, um, shortly thereafter, we made some uh, changes 
Um, and what that led to was my um, manager needing to take a different role for an interim, um, which ended up being about seven to eight months. Um, and I was asked to step in and, and kind of fill his shoes. And uh, yeah, I don't know if, it, well, one, it wasn't expected. So I don't know that I even thought about whether I wanted it or not. I don't know that I was given a choice um, in the matter. And I think for me, it was more of this fear of, you know, was I really ready to do that? Um, you know, there was a lot of things that my manager does that I'm not even involved in. So kind of the not even knowing what you don't know is part of the scary part. Um, and so I think what I would take from something like that is, you know, kind of like Brian, I mean, meeting and working with people that I don't normally work with in my regular role, um, learning things at a, a breakneck speed, um, you know, drinking from a fire hose, I think a lot of people refer to it as. Um, and so just taking that all in and then reflecting on what, if that role was available in the future, um, and it's something that I would want to do, what are the gaps? What did I learn about myself that um, I want to work on over the next, you know, year, two years, whatever it might be. Um, and so I think, Again, you know, just the, the exciting part of, of change is those learning opportunities that come along with it. So, mm -hmm. you know, that's a uh, <laughs> that's a key point, Megan. Uh, oftentimes, when we're asked to take on these new challenges, they could be pretty scary, mm -hmm. and you really don't know exactly what to do. Uh, uh, Prakash, I know that uh, in your career, you've had plenty of opportunities as well. It, what are the, what are the things that that, that you've had to deal with? Is, yeah. Yes, again, th thank you, Mark. And uh, again, I, ha I haven't had too many situations like that, but I did have at least one situation I can uh, discuss. It was much earlier in my career when I was working as a group leader in the research area, and I was asked if I would be interested um, in marketing position. Uh, right, but then uh, at that moment, I wasn't very interested in the marketing. Um, uh, so uh, how I handled that situation, again, responding very professionally and respectfully, the fact that uh, I would be able to make better contribution at the cu current position in R&D at that time, uh, where a lot of exciting things were going on. So I had to decline that. And the key thing here is the uh, for everyone, uh, the key thing is the, you know, you never know what's gonna happen in the future, right? If I was asked the same question after several years, maybe that would have been different situations. So, the, uh, so not to uh, burn that breeze, uh, we want to be very respectful and professional. When you decline at the same time, don't come out as a arrogant or conceited. So I think that can go a long way. Thank you. Mm -hmm. That's a good point. You know, one of the things that uh, one of my earlier bosses in my career told me, uh, and uh, uh, I, I kind of gleaned onto this a little bit as well, is that in the first five to 10 years of your career, you're going to set the basis for everything else that you do in your career. And that's going to have a lot of the impact that you have going forward. And it's hard to change from some of those things that you learned early in your career to make it uh, pertinent to today's situation. And I, and I can fully appreciate uh, where you're at with the earlier experience and not necessarily knowing where that might go. And I think, you know, for our attendees today, that might be you know, a question that they have in their mind as well. Uh, I will <laughs> encourage again, our, our attendees to, uh, uh, put some questions in the uh, little box down at the bottom of the screen and uh, and give us some of some of your thoughts and uh, and uh, let us talk a little bit about what's bothering you or what you would like to hear from us uh, uh, today. By the um, way, Mark, uh, there's nothing against marketing. <laughs> I like marketing now. Right? Yeah, uh, I, I never expected that I would be in sales later on in my career as well. I was thought I was going to be in technical uh, service forever and uh, things change. They yeah, do I just want to make clear that part. <laughs> there you go. Uh, 
Well, for, for our panelists, uh, what do you perceive to be harder? Do you perceive it to be harder to make a, uh, a job change or to be involved with a process that requires a major change? In its, uh, in its development. I'm, I'm curious where you're at. Megan, I'll, I'll go ahead and start with you. Yeah, no, it's a great question. And I think um, uh, the answer to a lot of questions like this is it depends. But in my mind, um, the process change, being involved in a big um, initiative that where things are significantly changing, to me is, is harder. Um, because a job change, you know, there's a lot of impact on you personally and potentially the people you work with directly. But a process change, I mean, I think about the example of uh, our company separating and then becoming a new, um, new privately held company. Um, everyone had to change and um, our processes had to change and how we did, how we operated day to day had to change and um, people adapt to that differently. People kind of go through that process of change and transition differently. And so for me, it's much harder um, when there's a lot of people involved and it's it's a whole process. Mm -hmm. uh, how, how do you think the best way to, to handle that uh, process changes? Do you have some, some tricks or clues that uh, might help uh, in those regards? Yeah, I mean, I think Communication is absolutely critical. Um, communication from leadership, communication, um, you know, across the board, allowing people to kind of process the change, recognizing at all levels that that everybody's going to go through this process differently. Um, so I think ultimately it comes down to communication, being open and clear as best you can throughout the whole process, not um, not communicating, okay, we're going to have this process change, and then off you go. Um, have it happen um, and and ignore um, the rest of the actual process because um, people go through literal transitions when you do big initiatives um, that are that are changing. So, mm -hmm. Brian, you've been through a, a number of uh, opportunities as well as we used to call them back at our company. Uh, uh, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I, I think Megan hit the nail on the head right off the bat. It, it depends on kind of the complexity or how much is changing for each one, right? You know, process changes, as she said, you know, there's a lot of difficulty in moving over to them. I think it's important to effectively communicate what's happening, especially upfront, give people an idea of what's coming um, so that they can be prepared for it because usually people are unhappy with, with those types of changes. So you have to give that a, them that opportunity and even a place for people to respond and provide feedback to make sure that, you know, you're starting to get support, um, you know, from people that have to implement that change. Um, for new job changes, one of the things that, that we always talk about is it's really difficult to change more than one thing at the same time. So you think of like geography, function or market space, right? Like if you're moving to a new job, you might pick one of those things to change, right? Stay in the same market space, but move from a technical role to a sales role. Or if you're in a technical role like in R&D, maybe that's a good time to move to a new market space. But moving any more than one of those things, it becomes much harder and it's gonna take you longer to come up to speed with that new job. Oh, great points, Brian. Uh uh, super, uh, super insight there. Uh, uh, take a little bit different uh, approach here. And uh, again, I, I encourage our, uh, our attendees to, to uh, pop a question or two down in the bottom of the uh, screen. Uh, but uh, you have all had interesting careers. And, and again, it, from my own personal standpoint, it's fascinating to sit and talk with you about uh, what you're doing and where you're at in, in the career. What's the, what's the best advice you ever uh, received in, in getting started in your career and uh, continuing your career? Now, you know, what maybe like the mentorship and maybe what kind of things happened along the way that helped you deal with change and transition? And, and Prakash, I'll go ahead and, and start out with you. Uh, I guess at different times, uh, I received different, very good advice, right? Um, which can I can talk about maybe one or two. Uh, the number one is, um, you know, uh, 
wherever you are, it could be the job or in your personal life, never judge people by her or his look, right? I mean, always like we are, a lot of us are technical folks, we need some data. <laughs> and have that data, if you want to make a real judgment on people or people's skill, let people give a chance. Um, uh, so again, uh, always, uh, so I have learned that over the time that I always give benefit of doubt to people, uh, the people either your supervisor or it could be people working for you. Uh, always uh, uh, be kind and supportive. And uh, the other part is, uh, you know, when you're doing a project and, you know, always begin with end in mind. You know, you have heard this many, many times. Again, if we don't have a clear vision or clear objective, what are we trying to do uh, in our project? You will never get there. So um, that is very important. Uh, so that will prevent you from being away from uh, digressing. Mm -hmm. no, that's, that's great stuff. Our path. Yeah. Yeah, that's great stuff. Uh, Brian, Brian, do you have any uh, uh, mentorship that uh, came along in your career that uh, helped guide you in the in the direction that uh, you went? Yeah, I think um, more so the the guidance on professional development. I don't know how much I adhered to this, but <laughs> it definitely was something that I thought was important, and it definitely. Um, opened up my mind at least to possibilities and made me think of, um, you know, what I might be able to do. But the, the advice was largely to not um, get so set on, you know, promotions and moving up or even function areas that you're in, right? Like if you're in one function like technical service, but you have a real interest in fundamental R&D, science, maybe you want to move from an application space to making materials, then go do it, right? It doesn't matter if it's a sideways move or even earlier in your career, if you want to, to step back and, and take a role to go learn those things. You know, there's value in learning lots of different aspects of what the company does. And you should, you know, you should lean into those opportunities, especially if it excites you and it's something you really want to do. So I think that was some advice early on in my career of somebody who did that, who really moved from lots of different functions. And it definitely didn't stop them from getting to what they wanted to do and at the level they wanted to do. So I thought that was great advice. Oh, that's super advice. Yeah. Megan, how about yourself? Yeah, no, Brian, that's fantastic advice. Um, and I would say for me, my career is not anything like I thought it would be, um, but never even thought I would end up in the paper industry. So you just never know. Um, but uh, for me, I think the, the biggest advice that I've tried to follow, um, and I think uh, funnels into you know work life, personal life, um, all of it is listening and really intentionally listening. Um, you know, early on in my career, I had mentors that, you know, the role models as well, not just saying, but this is how they, you know, acted, um, was just, you know, sitting down, whether that's in the paper mill, now as a supplier, um, sitting down with customers, really actively listening, let people talk um, and open up and, and really listen and, and intentionally give people that courtesy of uh of listening to them um so yeah megan that's that's huge uh one of the things that uh has struck me over the years is that anytime you're implementing a, a change or transition uh, working with the people that are absolutely the most intent on being having being impacted by it are the people that should have the most input and listening to them and understanding what their their viewpoints are and 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 addressing their viewpoints now, taking care of the things that need to be taken care of to make the process successful uh, that's huge and uh, and most of the time they're always smarter than i was you know regardless of what their job was they were always smarter than i was and uh and i i took that to heart we took that to heart Absolutely. Yep. So we're we're getting to uh, to close to the time that I'm, I'm gonna we're gonna switch back here, but I've got a couple 
other things that I'd like to ask the panelists here that uh, um, I think might be interesting for the uh, for the group here as well. And uh, the the key one here is here is is how was being involved with Tappy or the Coding and Graphic Arts Division impactful for your uh, your career and or make it easier for change and transition to happen in your lives or uh, in your company's life, so to speak. Uh, uh, and uh, Megan, I'm gonna, I'll, I'll start out with you again here. Yep, um, good question. So um, I, I mentioned this a little bit in the intro, but um, I didn't really expect to get all that involved in, in Tappy. It wasn't necessarily something I, I thought about, um, but as I attended, the conference and I attended um, a couple of the courses and then met people and then that just kind of ballooned into, you know, getting a little more involved and, um, you know, being an instructor and then getting involved in the committee. Um, so for me, the biggest impact is, again, just been meeting all these fantastic people. Um, you know, a lot of the people on the committees um, have a ton of experience know so many people um, <laughs> that, you know, they can make other connections um, with other people. And so bringing um, the young professionals into our committees is so, so critical because as you mentioned in the intro, Mark, with coding and graphic arts, we are changing and we need to be able to have not only the experience perspective, but the newer perspective and how we're going to change into the future. What, what do the committees really need to um, be focused on that are going to bring our um, our members development, networking opportunities, um, you know, chances to help out at TappyCon and volunteer and maybe be a, a session chair or you know be a subject matter expert because maybe you know a lot about a specific topic and you can help review presentations and papers. So there's so many different places that you can actually get involved. And I don't think I knew that early on. Um, so for me, the, the impact is just that continual addition of meeting more people, expanding the network, um, and then getting more involved. So yeah, that, that's good stuff. Yeah, you're absolutely right, Megan. Now, Brian, how about yourself? Sure. I thought Megan's answer was great. I mean, that's that's the the fun part about working with with Tappy, right? Is there's so many good people that we we meet with we talk to um it's just a great division to work with um i would say um thinking about it in the way of like change management especially if your company is going through some change or you're thinking about how you know your own career development is going and you're thinking about a change it's great to have uh, a network of people outside that company that you can talk to bounce ideas off of and that's your your constant right is the tappy group is there um they're in that industry that you know well so that's that's another uh, great way to to have a network out outside of your own company. Yeah, yeah, great, great, great thought, Brian. Absolutely. Prakash, how about you? Yes, um, my involvement with TAPI has been uh, very beneficial um, and actually fulfilling, right? Um, personally, personally and professionally, I came to the industry many, many years ago uh, from academia. Uh, so uh, I didn't have a lot of knowledge formal knowledge in a paper making or paper coding per se. Uh, so I had to learn, self-learn myself, a lot of this stuff uh, about paper making, paper properties and paper coding. And my involvement with Tappy really helped me accelerate um, my knowledge. Uh, when I started attending Tappy conference and uh, getting involved in different committees, I felt as if the expert in the industry, they are only phone call away or an email away uh, if you want to get some information. They were readily available. And again, uh, as Brian and Megan said, that's so many great people in Tappy, they are always willing to help. Um, so they really um, made my life much easier and to be very productive at work. And uh, let me just go back to the employer situation. I don't know whether that's what you may have a people working for you or maybe you, your supervisor 
here today, it is a very win-win situation for the company and the employees, and also the yourself employees and the tab all along. Uh, this is this is a very very uh, useful, helpful collaboration. Thank you. Yeah, that, that's super. And uh, uh, thank you, uh, uh, Betha, from uh, sending in a question. And I'd like this a real quick one because we have to move on to some other stuff, but. Bethel would like to know how you first got involved in Tappy and where should she start to get more involved with? And I think that's part of our, our goal today is to answer that question for everybody that's on board here. So uh, real quickly, uh, Megan, uh, how did you first get involved? Yeah, so I actually first got involved by doing a presentation. Um, it was actually a joint presentation with a supplier, but you know, got up, wrote, wrote a paper and then presented it at a conference. Um, and that's that's what started. So, and I think you can pick all kinds of different places um, to start if if that's scary. Um, maybe helping on the committee to to help be a session chair and moderate those speakers um, might be a good place to start. Or just joining a committee and and sitting through and hearing the types of things we need to work on to to plan the Tappycon. So, mm -hmm. cool. Uh, Brian, how about yourself? Yeah, similar situation. I think probably um, looking at the, the committees that are available, seeing what's uh, best fit for what your interest is or, or, you know, as well as what you're doing in your job, reaching out to that committee. I think the, the TAPI website has that. You can also reach out to anybody here um, that can help connect you with those people. And I think the committees are a great way to get involved. Um, there's a, you know, a lot of work that goes into planning TAPICON each year. There's also subcommittees that work on special projects. So um, we're happy to have more people. Yeah. Pr Prakash, how did you get first involved? Yes, you know, um, other than starting with uh, being a TAPI member, my first involvement was I attended a TAPI conference. And at that time, I volunteered to be a member of the pigment committee. I think that was back in uh, 97, 1998 or something like that. And then eventually that there was a lot of changes uh, in TAPI about that time. Actually, TAPI was in transition about around 2000. So the pigment committee changed to a coding material, a common interest group. What they wanted to do was bring all the coding materials together, which is pigment, binder, and additives. So that became a, they didn't call that committees afterwards, it's a common interest group. Anyway, I started with the pigment committee and, uh, and get involved with the common interest group uh, the coding material and move all the way to chair of that committee and all the way to uh, division chair so yeah it, it, that's it's that's a great uh, timeline to to look at prakash it's it's very very important uh, I, my own experience uh, bethel was that uh, I, I went to a short course back in 1980 um, got an opportunity to meet some people and that just kind of grit, drove the rest of my interest level and learning level to the point where I would ask for that in my annual review. Can I go to another short course? Can I, can I do something else? And and that's that's it's a great way to get started and a great way to learn people, learn uh, some of the people that are involved. And uh, again, as as uh, the panelists have all said, you reach out to us to any of us, and we'd be happy to help get you guided along in that regard. We're we're here to help you, and we're here to to uh, to get your career uh, on the pathway that you'd like it to be as well. Okay, with that, I'm going to thank our panelists uh, for uh, that session, and uh, we're going to go ahead and move on to the uh, a little bit about uh, what uh, coding and graphics arts are are all about here. And and uh, again, as our panelists uh, see something that uh, uh, they'd like to chip in on, I'll I'll uh, I'll have them do that, but. You know, the, the real question about uh, coding and graphic arts is, is why are we here? And we're really here to support the paper industry and uh, implement the cutting edge uh, developments that are needed in the industry today. We, we're we looking for a way to provide the um, uh, venue for uh, the science and for the production uh, partners in the, in the industry to share new novel concepts, the research and leverage the education and knowledge and best practices 
to enable the access of the coated paper and board industry. And that's kind of why we're here. Uh, now, what, what can we, what benefits can we provide as the Coding and Graphic Arts Division to uh, you folks that are thinking about getting involved? I think we talked a little bit about, about uh, networking with industry professionals. And this is just huge relative to being involved with the Coding and Graphic Arts Division. We have so many smart people, so many people that are experts, considered to be the top expert in their particular field within this group. So we're providing technical information and standards. We're reviewing and critiquing the science behind the process. In other words, we're not, we're not marketing this stuff. We're, we're actually looking into it deeper than, than just the, uh, the sales information page and looking to make sure that the science and the, and the technology behind the process is correct and is understandable to the people that are looking to, to work with it. So the opportunity to seek member, uh, mentorship uh, within the group, and again, collaborating with people uh, that have the same sort of things going on that you do makes it pretty, pretty interesting. So what's important to us? And, and Megan and Brian and Prakash have all been through this, uh, this rigor before, but here's the important points we want you to take, take away from today, making sure that you know that what we're about and that's providing sound technical advice to our members, again, by the review of papers and uh, that sort of thing, and encouraging the development in our fields so that we evolve and uh, promote the uh, evolution of the coding and graphic arts areas as we uh, go through our careers and as the industry evolves. What we also are, are pretty uh, keen on is developing that next generation of technical specialists. Now you're gonna have some uh, specialization within your own com uh, companies and you're gonna re receive some recognition relative to that internally. We'd like to help you receive some of that recognition externally as well. And we wanna make sure that that next generation of technical specialists helps promote and evolve the industry as well. So that's important to us. It's important for you as a development stage, but it's also important for us to help our members with practical solutions for their particular situations or problems. Uh, and again, uh, networking with the people in the Coding and Graphic Arts Division, particularly if you're involved with one of the committees, is absolutely a wonderful way to learn and get an encouragement and direction on problems that you might be having. So what, what do we think uh, looking ahead, you know, as we change our name to uh, coding and printing and surface enhancement, uh, what, are, what are we trying to do? We're gonna promote the science and understanding of our, our processes. We wanna help you as a member evolve in their, your career and the needs of the industry. Uh, maybe one of the more important things that uh, Megan uh, pointed out along the way here is we provide the programming to the Tampa conferences and to all of the short courses that we uh, uh, provide for the industry. And those short courses, again, are the fundamental education that you need to have to continue in the uh, uh, evolvement of your career and, uh, and learning about the processes. And of course, that means we wanna provide opportunities, particularly for folks like yourselves, the young professionals, to engage with us longtime TAPI members and gain something out of that in, uh, relationship. In other words, uh, make sure that the uh, so-called circle of life continues, uh, where we pass on the information that's so important for you to be successful in your career. And, and uh, it's just, it's huge. Yeah. So here's an example. Prakash and the, his materials committee right now are, are uh, in the process of putting the book together. And this is going to be available in later in, in 2023. It's the Pigments for Paper and Paperboard book. A wonderful uh, re resource for uh, getting the fundamentals of how the interaction of pigments and, and other uh, uh, portions of the coding process interact with each other. What's important, what's not. Um, 
And, and you, as a member of a committee like that, can be involved at that, with that. You can be a part of these kind of projects. So you're contributing and learning at the same time. Uh, Oslam's part of that team. Uh, Prakash leads up that group. We have two or three other books being published uh, in the division right now. Uh, one is a coding process book that's been around forever and we were revising it again. Interesting stuff. Uh, but we need to, to involve as many people in these things as we possibly can. We'd love to have you involved with that. So I'm going to turn it back over to Oslo here. Great, great insights. Thank you, everybody. And this part is for our fellow YPs. So this is our question to you. What takeaways do we need to get involved with coding and graphic arts? I see from the questions that you're looking for to understand what is the first step for me in order to be part of the CGA, part of the more uh, actively the YP. And we will be sharing this communication contact information and later on. But I would like to give you the opportunity to ask questions as well as to tell us those are the things that I needed in order to get involved with coding and graphic arts and you are able to write your um, answers directly to the Q&A in your screen. So if you have any questions, we will be waiting. And also before we uh, end our sessions today, we will be rechecking this uh, open question boards and try to answer it as much as, much as we can. So moving to the next part now, so what we learned, right? There was a great discussion with our panelists and co-moderator. And before we wrap up and everything, I think the summary of this conversation was, there is always something you can learn. Even though change is hard, yes. Uncomfortable, yes. But meeting new people with new skill set, as our panelists said, and growing in leadership and communication, maybe not necessarily in the project that you are working on and solving the problems together with those teams. And seriously being a part of this process and TAPI allows you to get this networking abilities outside of your company. As a friendly reminder from our panelists, we learned that change one variable at a time. If you are moving to another location, let it be the only change. Or if you are changing your marketplace, try to stay in the same place to deal with one thing at a time. Before I forget, don't forget to be open, clear, and precise about the directions and give people a chance to bring feedback and share their responses. So this is what we have learned today. And thank you for our panelists for sharing great insights. For our next part, we will gonna follow and give you an opportunity to have um, talk about our next events. From the Young Professionals Division perspective, you can directly scan the QR code. And if you want, would like to be part of the YP board, we have some openings right now. And if you would like to just receive the emails from Lisa for our YP events and our collaborations like this one, please scan the barcode and try to be part of our member. And second one, we have a great opportunity for our next uh, virtual mixer, which is on Thursday, August 17 at 12 p.m. EDT. And this is our virtual mixer where the young professionals come together to chat and talk about the issues that are the theme of the virtual mixer. And if you would like to know more information about this, please contact Lisa Lackwood. And from the CGA side, you can also um, scan the QR code. And for more information, you can directly reach out to Tyler Mas, how you can be part of the CGA committees and how you can take a part of the next TAPICON by helping the CGA. And we want your feedback. After this event, you will gonna receive an email from Lisa that asks you, how did we do? So we will really appreciate if you can mark us and share your information. And this is the actually end of our event today. Right now it's in my Chicago time, it's 12.01. It's probably where you are is 1.01. So we are one, two minutes um, extended our meeting. And in case you want to reach out me or Mark, this is our emails and I'm gonna see you next time.
in the next open house. Thank you, everybody. Yeah, and thanks again for attending today. And thanks again to our, our panelists, Prakash, uh, Megan, and Brian. Uh, they did a wonderful job in, in sharing some of their insights with you. And we appreciate your time. So thanks again for attending. Bye, everybody. <laughs>